Hi, this is William Brent from Power for All. We're pleased to have Ben Atia join us in conversation. Ben is a research analyst at Wood McKenzie Power and Renewables, a leading insight and advisory firm focused on renewable energy, including solar, wind, storage, power markets, and the grid edge. Ben leads the firm's coverage on off-grid power markets for energy access, as well as solar PV market intelligence and consulting in Africa. He's also a non-resident fellow at the Payne Institute at the Colorado School of Mines, as well as uh, at the Energy for Growth Hub at the Center for Global Development, and directs market development and strategy for Me Panyar, a startup implementing a community-based operations and capacity building model for mini grids in rural Myanmar. Wow, that's a lot, Ben. Thank you for uh, taking time out of what must be a very busy schedule to, to join us. Sure. Thanks, Will, for having me. Appreciate it. Our pleasure. So uh, let's jump right in. This is uh, our issue uh, of the newsletter fo and in, uh, focused on what we expect for 2019 in the off-grid sector or dis distributed renewable energy sector. Um, I'll kick it off with a, a very broad question. Um, you know, I think we've seen from research on global tracking uh, on finance into the distributed renewable energy sector that uh, while the gap is closing on the needed investment, companies delivering electricity access are still facing a pretty large shortfall of capital. So based on what you see and what you know, do you think that's going to change in 2019? Yeah, I think it's a good question, um, and I'll give you a sort of a yes and no answer. Um, so we've also been tracking corporate level investments in energy access markets, um, and we have conceded investment continue to accelerate uh, year on year. So total disclosed direct investment, according to our database, grew 22% uh, from 2017 to 2018. Um, and we actually saw sort of a, a stabilization of the debt equity balance uh, or the debt equity mix in the total investment landscape so to get pretty close to 50-50. Um, after a really strong swing towards uh, just about 50% term loans and venture debt in 2017, uh, which actually is a signifier of, of uh, maturation in the sector. On the private sector, uh, we actually might see some increased caution um, entering 2019 as the top investment recipients, um, which are pretty much all pay go solar home system companies that primarily operate in East Africa, uh, they're, they're all quite well capitalized and, and some are potentially overvalued. Um, and we've seen uh, sort of a, a lack of a track record of successful exits so far. So as they start to run up against the limits of their low-cost addressable markets um, and, and start to sort of face a, some more maybe existential questions about uh, what exactly a, a pace go solar home system is supposed to solar home system company is supposed to be, um, they're, they're going to sort of uh, face this question of going deep versus going wide, um, as I've kind of put it before, which is uh, kind of balancing growing market share and acquiring customers versus uh, profitability, you know, cutting OPEX, boosting repayment rates, tightening their credit requirements, deepening customer value, stuff like that. Um, and, and a lot of those questions are sort of barely scratched the surface in terms of, of what's to be answered. Um, there's still a lot of experimentation to be done to try to figure out how deep those average revenue per customer really is and how to stimulate demand, how to stack value on top of those existing customer relationships, through partnerships, value-add services, etc. Um, but we're starting to see a lot of experimentation in that front. You know, BBOX is doing a lot with piloting internet water and tomorrow's rural home is a prime example. Um, Unilever is partnering with Azuri, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so, however, there's you know there's a strong concentration of, uh, of investment at the top. Um, within the top 10 deals, uh, which is about $564 billion uh, by our count, and that's only through the end of 2018. That doesn't even include um, some of the deals that we've already seen in this year. Uh, that's about a third of total capital deployed uh, to date. Um, so we're seeing a, a bit of a sort of a concentration risk in the market there. Um, and, Sorry, what, ben, what was that number again? What, what was that total number again? $564 billion from okay. the top 10 deals through the end of 2018. And that's about a third of capital deployed to date. Um, so there's a concentration risk is, is kind of the point there. Um, you know, we're seeing it's geographically concentrated, it's concentrated in technology and business model and into a few companies. Um, and that does pose a risk uh, for the broader sector. Um, and it, it does leave out sort of the the long tail of um, solar installers or sort of the, the wave two or, or pay go 2.0 companies. Um, there are, however, hundreds of millions of public dollars waiting in the wings for the sector. Uh, particularly for mini grids, which is super exciting. Um, it's been a critically undercapitalized sector and in, in many ways sort of mischaracterized in terms of return expectations by investors so far. 
Um, so we've seen, you know, sort of the, the RBS facility from AFDB, uh, supported by AMDA, ISA is working on energy access fund, the World Bank has started to participate in um, RBF, particularly in Nigeria, um, the list goes on. Uh, but kind of to go back to the question, um, the most skilled players in the solar home system space are quite capitalized. Um, they typically need to raise cash every 18 months, um, but we'll probably see some private sector caution around further rounds until we start to see profitability and have a better sense of the true value of the addressable market, get a better sense of the depth of customer average revenues, things like that. Um, you know, so we'll probably see a shift towards the sort of wave two companies, uh, particularly those that are unbundled. Um, because it gives us a little bit of a better way to value them. Uh, there's been some good research done in that space that I'm sure most of you have seen. Um, so I do expect public sector capital to make some significant contributions to the sector, particularly in the mini-grid space. I do think we'll see some more investors come to the table, but I, I don't think, think the gap's going away in 2019. And in fact, sort of structurally, it may actually grow a bit, even though more capital is flying. Interesting. Okay. Well, that's uh, definitely a mixed uh, picture. Um, do you yeah. do you expect uh, the strategics to become more acquisitive? Um, you know, you've seen acquisitions or near acquisitions of Phoenix and Simpa Networks. Do you uh, expect the big players to come in more aggressively starting this year, or is is that just going to continue in a in a more gradual fashion? Yeah, I, I do expect that to pick up, and that's actually uh, one of the things I'm most excited about for for this year, looking in the off grid space. Um, you know. We're, we're actually doing some research on that now. Uh, we've got a report coming out in a few weeks. So I, I won't uh, sort of give away all of our forthcoming findings, but um, th there's a, this is something we've been watching quite closely for a while now, and, and it's been noticed, but sort of maybe not super well quantified to date exactly how the strategics are participating in the space um, and exactly how they're thinking about the space. Um, you know, this they've seen increasing investments in, in uh from global energy players, from sort of European utilities, oil and gas majors, uh, you know, global OEMs in the um, inverter space, and in the um, sort of other charge controllers, uh, wind, gas turbines. We've seen Japanese trading houses. We've seen uh, sort of uh, broad uh, international banks on the private sector side um, that are starting to pay increasing attention to this space and to make equity investments. Um, and there's, you know, there's a lot of thinking that's gone into this beyond. Uh, just sort of watching and seeing or trying to learn. Uh, they, they do view this as a, as a commercial growth opportunity um, and as a high growth future market uh, and, and as a sort of a, a pathway or an avenue into uh, rural customers. And, and, I, um, and this, you know, a lot of them have sort of incubated this uh, thinking or their processes here within uh, CSR groups, but um, this, this is not CSR for the strategics, and I do expect that they'll increasingly um, start to participate, start to, um, you know, we'll, we'll probably see more acquisitions, some more M&A within the space, um, and we'll probably see uh, an increasing amount of um, sort of partnerships and joint ventures, as well as uh, sort of financial intermediary investments, uh, such as, you know, Schneider's Energy Access Ventures Fund, uh, or, or uh, participation in SunFunder with uh, you know, Shell and, and some of the like. Yeah. Um, so I do think that will pick up. Um, so far, they've committed to electrify 164 million people, 100 million of that is Shell, so we got to sort of put that aside or contextualize that a little bit there. Uh, but they, they do seem very keen to play a fundamental role in the market. Uh, the biggest question so far is really just how committed they are. Um, so far, they're still kind of just dipping their toes into the space, uh, but there's no question that they're changing the trajectory of the market. Um, it does open up a lot of questions, though. Like, uh, there's a lot of their peers which have yet to participate, some of the other oil majors, some of the other tech companies, um, fast-moving consumer goods sector, other Japanese trading houses, um, Chinese institutionals. Uh, you know, why or why not are they interested? Will that change? Uh, we'll probably see more of them start to enter the space. Uh, the huge sort of elephant in the room is telcos, um, why they haven't sort of made good distribution partners for solar home system companies so far. Um, that question has been raised at some of the, you know, the recent industry conferences, uh, but you know, there's some operational synergies there that are pre pretty obvious, and, and yet the, the telcos are still, for the large part, on the sidelines. Um, you know, what, does this do like, what does this do for uh, you know, the flow of capital from other sources? You know, will we see strategic investments disrupt uh, debt markets or, or PE firm participation? Will they be willing to do follow-on investments to strategics? In other sectors that we've studied, we've seen that that's you know maybe less less true than uh, the sector might like. Um, you know things like that, uh, relative price elasticity of the strategics and, and sort of broader market fundamentals that are at play. Um, so stay tuned. Uh, I don't want to give away too many of our findings, but uh, we're working with Energy for Impact on a, on a report that 
kind of addresses the investment landscape and the strategics and their participation in the off-grid space. Um, that'll be out in a few weeks, so stay tuned there. Great. Exciting to see that. Um, so, okay, here we go. Last two questions, Ben. I'm going to see if I can get sure. you to answer them in 30 words or less, okay? <laughs> sure. Here's the challenge. Okay, so from your perspective, what is the most exciting positive development that the energy access sector can expect in 2019? Sure. Yeah, I think it's the strategics. I think it's what I was just saying. I think, you know, we'll see more of them start to participate in a way that, uh, you know, really starts to, to change the trajectory of the space and um, starts to bring it legitimacy uh, and global attention. Thank you. That was pretty close to 30 words. Uh, and then lastly, uh, we talked about the most exciting development. What's going to be the biggest challenge for 2019? I think it's maybe a, an identity crisis. Um, it, it, maybe that's you know sort of a dramatic way to say it, but um, I think pay-to-go companies in particular are just trying to figure out: are they energy service providers, rural utilities, consumer finance companies, retail product sales, all of the above? Um, you know, what does this unbundling challenge really look like? It's a huge opportunity, but I think it also faces a risk if if it's not done well. And what is that risk? Uh, I think the risk is that uh, the the cost synergies that are saved from vertical integration start to go away um, and customer acquisition costs start to rise as you know you need a, a technology provider you need a, a software systems provider you need a financial institution to participate um, you know securitizing these these uh, assets is difficult um, customer acquisition is difficult particularly after sort of low hanging fruit uh, customers have been acquired particularly in east africa so you know, there's a lot of questions that go into how do we how do we keep this profitable? Um, we can measure the profitability a little bit easier, but how do we sort of actually become profitable in different segments? Okay, interesting. All right, Ben, we'll uh, we'll have to you know do this again next year and uh, review your prognostications uh, and see how you did. Yeah. But uh, again, thanks. See so how cloudy my crystal ball actually is. <laughs> exactly. Thanks for, thanks for having me. Well. Yeah. No. Thanks so much, Ben. And uh, we'll uh, if, if for those of you who didn't hear the beginning. Uh, if you want to learn more about Ben, uh, check out the Wood McKinsey Power and Renewables uh, website. Thanks again, Ben. Yeah, thanks, Will. Um, all right, so. Clear. That, that was. This audio is made with Audio Toolkit for Windows Store, downloaded for free now. This audio is made with Audio Toolkit for Windows Store, downloaded for free now.